Hello, I'm Jake Tapper in Washington, where the State of Our Union is appalled. We begin this morning with a retweet from the President of the United States, not a message about healing or uniting the country one week after two horrifying massacres, not about the victims of those tragedies. Instead, President Trump, using his massive Twitter platform, 63 million followers, to spread a deranged conspiracy theory, tying the death of pedophile Jeffrey Epstein in prison to the president's former political rivals, the Clintons. I'm not going to show you the tweet, but the spokesman for former President Bill Clinton responded to the president retweeting it, saying, quote, ridiculous and of course not true, and Donald Trump knows it. Has he triggered the 25th Amendment yet? President Trump could use his megaphone for anything, but the president often uses it to amplify that which is the worst of us personal attacks, bigotry, and insane conspiracy theories. Officials say Epstein died by apparent suicide while in the custody of the federal government. The Attorney General, William Barr, released a statement opening an investigation into how this happened, saying he was, quote, appalled and saying Mr. Epstein's death raises serious questions that must be answered, unquote. This is, of course, not the first time that President Trump has chosen to use his amplified voice to spread conspiracies. He lied about President Obama's birthplace. He suggested Ted Cruz's father might have been involved in the JFK assassination. He lied that he saw American Muslims in New Jersey on TV celebrating 9-11 when there is no such tape. President Trump has also given voice to the lie that the migrant and refugee crisis at the southern border of the U.S. is a plot by Jewish billionaire George Soros to fund a, quote, invasion. That's a conspiracy theory that was the motive for mass slaughter in Pittsburgh and El Paso. This is no longer just irresponsible and indecent. It's dangerous. This is warrior country, an ancient land that seems designed for conflict. And now Yemen is being torn apart again. The UN says it's one step away from famine because of war. But on a 4,000 kilometer journey through the worst hit areas, we found innocent people brought close to death by a rebel Houthi government that's manipulating aid, while UN officials try to stop them. We found evidence of this throughout northern Yemen, first in Bani Qais, five hours drive from the capital. How are you surviving for food? How do you get food? My husband goes to work. He gets 500 or 1,000 rials and he buys food for us and goes home. But there is no money for clothes, diapers for the children, or medicine. And why do you think you, you're not getting aid here? Is to people, why, why are people not getting help? They don't reach us here. They used to give us grains and flour, but then they refused to give it to anyone. They don't give us anything. Already dirt poor, people here relied on UN handouts. But they stopped when the World Food Programme discovered that supplies were going missing. So in this village there's some malnutrition and people are saying that they're not getting any uh, aid. What, why is that? They used to give parents a bag of grains, oil and other stuff every month. This stopped two months ago. We don't know why. There are people higher up who know why. It's a problem that's been raised at the highest levels. We've certainly, in several situations, had to say to local authorities, you don't let us in there, we can't continue these programs. And that's why we've been forced into situations where we've said, if you don't let us in, if you don't let us do our jobs properly, then we're not going to be able to continue. This is Aslam. The UN has been denied access to this area and has stopped food distributions because they cannot be monitored. It's only a few miles from the front line. 10,000 people have poured into camps like this in a few weeks. They're victims of a war being waged by a Saudi-led coalition armed by the US and others against the Iranian-backed Houthi rebels. What we have, we scrounge from others. And when we get our rations from the World Food Programme, I give back people what I owe but we haven't had anything from the World Food Programme for two months. We have nothing now. So again, vulnerable people are being denied aid by the UN because the Houthi government won't allow access and independent monitoring. Close to the refugee camps, 
This clinic struggles to cope. This boy has infected lungs. The doctors say as a direct result of malnutrition. He's almost a year old, but he's the weight of a baby at three months. These children are victims of a vicious circle. They're starving because of the siege of the port that supplies them and their rebel Houthi government's diversion of what little aid gets in. In the Yemen now, nearly everyone is short of food. Malnutrition isn't only a problem among the displaced and the host community. We have it too. Even us, the employees, our children back home are malnourished. The Houthis are under siege. Their access to the outside world cut by coalition attacks on this, the main port of Hodeida. Since the Saudi-led coalition imposed a blockade on this port and attacked it from the air, it's done about $800 million worth of damage. It's halved the amount of food and other materials coming into the port and it's destroyed about 60% of its capacity. The idea, of course, is to try to strangle the capacity of the Houthi regime to survive. The irony, of course, is from the Houthi perspective, a control over a limited amount of supply, particularly when it comes to food, means you have control over everything. In the capital, Sana'a, the Houthi government denies this. Essentially, they're saying that you're very controlling and that you're using this for, to, to win friends politically around the country, using foreign aid to win friends, to win political influence. What you said can be described as inaccurate. Mistakes happen sometimes, but that doesn't mean or doesn't represent a policy on our side. We are happy with whatever aid reaches citizens because these citizens are our strength and support. They are our capital in this war. But here, aid officials insist that food has been weaponized. Without free food from the outside world, the Houthi government would struggle to survive. The UN plans to feed 12 million this year, mostly in the Houthi areas. Are you not worried that by being here you could be prolonging the war? Certainly humanitarians are not political. We're here to keep people alive. The responsibility for ending the conflict is in the hands of the people who are driving that conflict. Caught in the middle, women and children here struggle with hunger in a war where Yemen's powerful factions ignore the responsibility to their own people and demand that foreigners supply the aid to support them. Sam Kiley, CNN, Northern Yemen.